Howdy, this is part 4 of the machine learning project series, so if you're interested in the details of its computational conception, please check out part 1 of the series or look through a current project playlist. If that's not your fancy, I totally understand. Just stick right here and continue watching to find out more about the application and its implications for the future. Whoever you may be, here's a quick recap of the work we've done so far. We've collected data from the many different sources, developed features that will plug into the model, and trained preliminary models whose performance we've been testing this whole time, and continuously discussing what we might do with the results. Today, we're going to quickly cover our last machine learning task, which was hyperparameter tuning, and then head straight into an application that we've built as a website and how that can be used. I've learned that this part isn't of too much interest to most people in our audience and in hopes of keeping you here, I'm going to put myself on a 4 minute timer to explain what hyperparameter tuning is, how we used it and also how we developed the whole backend and frontend of our application that we've made into a publicly accessible website. And we're starting now! Alright, so hyperparameters are parameters that are set for machine learning models before the training begins, like the number of hidden layers in the model or the learning rate, as opposed to normal parameters like weights which are determined throughout the training process. Hyperparameter tuning or optimization is choosing the most suitable set of these hyperparameters that best fit the data set or problem that you have. The same model can perform pretty distinctly given different types of data, and that's what makes this process so important but also pretty grueling. The process of hyperparameter tuning is what I like to call structured trial and error. The most basic form of it, which is what I've done, is to essentially use the model with a bunch of different options. A bunch of different options for hyperparameters, going through all the permutations and then seeing what ends up being the best. To do this, I went through all the code that we've previously had in notebooks and made them into separate scripts, so it'd be easier for us to run through all the hyperparameter options. I made three scripts, one is pre-processing, where we normalize the data, extract the features and then select the best out of them. Models, where we train and save the models, uh, it's also where the hyperparameter tuning happens. Then a script for application, which is semi-new, we just take the models that we've saved and use them with the newest set of data that we have. And then we write these predictions to CSV files. As you can see here, we select a bunch of different hyperparameters, like number of dropout layers, LSTM units, batch and buffer size, which we then use in a unique combinations over and over while saving the results to try and find what works best. After going through many iterations, I found that these were the parameters that worked best for the model and proceeded to make a bunch of example models based on the items that, uh, that were frequently traded and also typically cost more than 1000 GP. I also only chose non-member items for now as I was testing with a non-member account and didn't have much money to begin with anyway. I tested out uh, the application script and then we were ready to put it into action. I took my Amazon EC2 instance that I had been collecting data with and put all the necessary scripts and models there. Then I started predicting and saving the predictions using the newly collected data right after it was fetched. I used something called CronTap for the scripts that needed to repeatedly run. Uh, how it works is pretty simple. Right here it says that you know every hour at the 21st and 51st minute mark, we run this script, which is our scraper that collects our data. And then we take the prediction like a minute after. The API usually updates every 20th and 50th minute of the hours, but sometimes it's just a little bit off and I didn't want to take the chance. So now that the prediction data was being collected, we still needed a way to see the results and have the user interface to actually make use of them. Using my hackery dackery skills, I quickly popped up a Flask web server that would serve the data on the backend with Python to a very simple HTML and JS frontend. This is where I spend most of my time trying to make the graph pretty using d3.js, which is a beautiful data visualization engine in JavaScript. I mean, just look at these transitions. More importantly, I worked on a simple suggestion page which used the estimate predictions and profits of all the items that we had. The page suggests the best items to buy based on your current amount of money and how much we think it'll cost one time step into the future. I spent a bit of time making sure all the code including that uh, including that of the web servers was dynamic and that anyone who would like to take on the project or even just train their own models in the future would have an easier time with it. And that's, that's everything folks. Um, that was the end of the development cycle thus far. And the best part is the web server was easily made available for public access through EC2, 
so I'm going to leave it up for as long as I don't get hacked, which may not be very long since I'm already seeing some weird ass injection like commands. So our website today has three main applications, two of which I've already talked about. The homepage, where you can see all the predictions in the last day for any item that we're currently predicting on. The suggest page, where like we mentioned earlier, you can get some suggestions of what to buy based on the money that you have to invest. Now a little fun fact, you can also change the prediction model parameter to the model that you want to use for suggestions. One is for univariate, two for multivariate single step and 3 to 7 for multivariate, multi steps 1 to 5 respectively. And lastly, the API page where if you ever feel the need, you can pull data from for the latest predictions. Here you can also change the name variable to whichever item you'd like provided the item is in our database. Before I go further, I want to give a huge shout out to Max Luck, who I've had a chance of calling and speaking to in greater detail about GE and flipping in general and how it can be used. Alright, now on to how I've been using it, right? So for example, if I started out with 1 mil and I usually split it into 2, you know, to invest in multiple things at once, I type in 500k and just look at the suggestions that comes up. Then I check out the margins of each item that I'm interested in to see what prices, you know, are really out there. Because what we have is just a buy average and sometimes in the online APIs, they just aren't accurate anyway. But not to worry, you'll see that our model will at least prove useful in predicting the trends of the items. So we can be confident that this item, you know, will go up in price or, you know, know that this item is the right one to buy. After that, I buy them at the lowest price that I can. Sometimes there isn't much of a particular item in stock like with the Zemurak Monk tops here. So we may have to wait or move on to a different item. So seeing this issue now, I definitely consider, you know, finding out what the typical selling amount is for each item and looking at the items that have a high trade volume as suggested on Reddit. Lots more of improvements, but we'll discuss that in the next section. Anyway, once I buy the item, I can sit back in confidence that the price of the item will rise and I know that I can sell it later for a higher price. So I sell it at the top of the margin or if I'm feeling cheeky at an even higher price, just waiting for it to come in. For extra assurance, I look at the graph and its history as well as to see what kind of high points it's been able to hit and looking at the current trend of the item. A lot of these items suggested are low buying quantity ones so I go back and try it. A true favourite of mine, Runite Ore. It's not much of a profit a few steps into the future as predicted but it showed us that it was worthwhile. It was a worthwhile item looking into. As Lugus Intelligence mentioned, it's possible that we're predicting trends as opposed to precise values. Hence, looking at the graph, we can see that it will get higher based on its history. This tactic obviously has some flaws, but it's just an experiment and I hope it serves as a cool enough proof of concept to get people interested. In less than 30 minutes, we see our first prediction comes true. We might have to wait for some time for the other ones as we stretch the prices a little bit in anticipation of further prices to go up. But slowly and surely, they get there. In the future, especially for people who just like to leave items there and go play instead of flipping quickly and consistently, this means that they have an easy way to weed out the items that they can confidently invest in, and then they just sit back and watch the money come in. Remember, it's always smart to have money earning passive income in the bank. Now, however, you no longer have to really know what the market is like or look at a bunch of different graphs of items yourself. Now you will be able to know in the future your investments will turn a profit so you can just dump, go and soon enough come back to some dough. So one last huge shout out to all those who commented on Reddit, Facebook, YouTube and Discord with suggestions and potential improvements, all of which are super valid and very important to the continuation of this project. However, the further you go down any path, the more you begin to understand how deep the path really goes. Similarly, this project has come a long way, but the more I look at it, the more it seems like there is to do. That said, I've been feeling super burnt out recently from this project in particular, and I think it's time for me to move on for at least a little bit. Hence, this section will serve as more of a short reminder of what is left to be done through a compilation of your comments and suggestions. I will either be, I mean, it will either be for my future self or for anyone who'd like to take on this project themselves. So the first one, and it's a big one, is using updates. As we've seen, they, they clearly govern a lot of what players do in-game but also change the marketplace drastically. I personally think it could be an amazing feature, but 
it may be hard to execute, not just with fetching the information, but also parsing the updates to see what you know what up what items are really important in this update. Max Luck also had some interesting notes that I'll leave in the description below about some economics principles that say that updates may not be as important as we think. Now, bots. Bots are definitely a clear market changer as well, but I have some comments about this which I've explained before, so in the sake of time, I'm leaving my summarized comments below along with Max Luck's well explained argument. Now, moving on, you could also train with more high frequency items as suggested on Reddit. Um, training with groups of items like a hot index or a food index, I think those are very important as well. Those are, those are definitely features that you know I didn't think about and could be added on. Other than that, there's obviously the case for more data. So, you know, especially when we're doing a time series like this, all I have is data for like one or two months, which is nearly not enough sometimes, right? Sometimes you need years of data, especially for something as complex as a you know a marketplace. Now Another big thing is maybe using a less complex model. So for a time series analysis, a lot of the models sometimes are more simple and you know less complex than the machine learning or deep learning model that we're using now, which is LSTMs. There's also a lot of things we can do with XG boosting if we wanted to. And lastly, just quickly looking over our application, we could definitely include different bands of items. So if you're poor, you go through you know these items that are one GP to one KGP and so on and up from there. We could also include a bunch of members items which people mostly trade with anyway. And we can include buy limits because once you're up there trading with millions and millions, buy limits are very important. We could include the quantity that is typically bought because, you know, like we experienced earlier, sometimes you can't invest in items that just aren't being sold. Anyway, now if anyone has any more suggestions, I would absolutely still love to hear them. And I can include them on the Git me Git GitHub read me. <laughs>And that's everything for now folks, thank you so much for being the amazing audience that you have been and I hope I get to see you back here again soon. RuneScape has always meant so much to me, doing this project meant that I didn't get as much time to play, but I recently played around a bit again and it was magical. It brought back so many good old memories. I remember the first time that I smelted two pieces of ore together that I had mined myself. I remember the first time that I was assaulted on a road to Varrock by horrible wizards. I remember the first time that I fought a barbarian that unexpectedly yelled at me. The game is wonderful and I hope that I can contribute to this wonder in the future. That is why my next project will be about using machine learning to identify bots. Well then, till next time, to the loop.